Great, welcome. Virtual reality. In a sense, the games have always created it, even before the modern headsets, the technology, and stuff like that. So we're here to talk about five must-have design strategies for better VR games. And so why are we here? Well, this is, it's not the technology that we're talking about. We've got some amazing tech. Uh, this is why we're here. It's the delight in people's faces as they play. You know, games are not about, uh, games are not about the hardware. They're about the experiences that the gameplay creates. And uh, this, is, this is why we're here. How many people are working in VR right now? Awesome, awesome. And how many people are doing AR? Okay, oh, very good, awesome, this is, this is great. So we're doing that, not this, right? We don't want this kind of an experience, nor do we really want this. Last year's hit console game, now with zombies and VR support. That's not why we're here today either. Okay, what VR needs is design leadership, not management. Just reskinning last year's hit titles with VR or AR, other technologies, isn't going to move us, move the player, and move the industry into this new frontier that we're all excited to be, to be joining. So who am I? Well, I am, uh, whoops, let's go. I'm going to ignore that monitor for a second. <laughs> uh, so VR needs design leadership and why? Let me just tell you a few things. The first thing is that it has more physiological challenges, more psychological challenges, and more design challenges than any other game platform transition we've had in the past 30, 40 years of games combined. That's what we're facing right now. And that's why I say that VR needs better design leadership. So who am I? I'm Nicole Lazaro. For those of you who haven't met, haven't heard me talk, I'm an expert on gameplay and emotion. I have a degree in cognitive psychology from Stanford, and essentially I measure the emotions on players' faces while they play games. Some of my models have been downloaded by hundreds of thousands of developers around the world. Many of them are in the audience today. And uh, I am also, uh, in a sense, I grew up in Wonderland. I uh, grew up riding camels, climbing pyramids, exploring fire temples. I spent some time um, outside of you know, the United States. And why VR is interesting to me is I really want to go back. I really want to go back to experience all of the magic that we can, that we can do uh, together. So for uh, the past 23 years, I've run Zio Design, a company, uh, we're a game consulting company, so we help clients such as you make their games better. Uh, we've improved over one billion uh, player experiences working with a number of super talented teams, uh, from Mist and, the, uh, Mist and The Sims to uh, even working with groups like the, the White House. And we've done this by asking one question, which is a very important one that I want you to ask while you're here thinking about VR, which is this which is where's the fun, okay? Because that's, that's why we're here, it's games, it's not virtual reality, it's not a head-mounted display, it's, it's the game, it's the fun. And what we've done is we've measured emotion on players' faces, hundreds of emotions come out of gameplay, we've uh, grouped them into a model called the uh, four keys, and we found that basically games are played for four reasons. They're played for novelty, they're played for challenge, they're played for friendship, and they're playing for meaning. And these different experiences in games separate the best sellers uh, from, the, uh, from the ones that don't, don't do quite as well. And people tend to move between these, uh, these types of fun in a single gameplay session, regardless of where you're playing Tetris, Call of Duty, uh, or the new, the new VR games. And so this is the four keys to fun. You can download it uh, off of our website, if you like. And uh, we believe that basically games have unlocked human potential. And so the emotional experiences that games create are all really going to uh, transform our players. And that's when they really, they really are excited. This is the game uh, called Tilt World. It's based on the first iPhone game. So I designed the first iPhone game back when the iPhone first came out, a game called Tilt. And now it's planted 16,000 trees on the island of Madagascar, uh, thanks to our players. Well, thank you. <laughs> and then, uh, so games can do a lot. We also have this other game that's uh, called Lux, and it's a game about forgiveness. So again, we can move players emotionally, and that's what this talk is about, is how can we use VR? What are some tools, some design strategies to move people emotionally? 
And then the third thing that I like uh, is another game that I did for the VR mobile game jam. Uh, it's called Follow the White Rabbit. I did this with uh, Brandon Jones. He did the art. I did the uh, game design and the coding uh, in Unity. And uh, what we did is uh, this, interesting, uh, this interesting experience. So I'd like to show you uh, a clip from the, this is the teaser trailer. Thank you. So with that, uh, what inspires me about VR is the ability to create emotion. And the, uh, th this game is about a magician who's been a charlatan like all his life until one day his magic actually works. The rabbit went into the hat but did not come back out. Uh, which is, and then to make matters worse, uh, it was wearing a priceless diamond bracelet picked from the audience. And so now you and everybody else wants to follow the white rabbit. And so what fascinates me, that's the game. Uh, we're, still, we're still working, it's still deep in development. But we believe, we really firmly believe at Zeo Design and Zeo Play, is that VR has the potential to deliver more emotion than movies or traditional games. And in a sense, if you think of the history of movies, we've had this increased emotion from birth of a nation to movies like Inception. The technology, the language of cinema has improved. And on games, we've actually increased our, ability, our agency from Pong to Mass Effect to Journey, all climbing this thing of emotion. Well, VR, we really feel, is that center, that, that intersection between the immersive, qualities that games, um, the immersive qualities that movies have and the agency that, that, games, uh, that games bring. Now, many assume, the first thing is, many assume that, you know, well, the, first, the language of cinema and then the game design tropes, we can just mash those together and we'll create great VR experiences like this one I'm enjoying here, which is called Middle Seat. Uh, however, you know, nothing can really be further from, from the truth. What VR requires is really design, design leadership. And I say leadership rather than uh, management, like I showed earlier, uh, because of these three, um, these three things. Management is really about chaos, managing chaos, according to John Carter from Harvard Business Review. Leadership is about change. And we are, again, at this platform shift, it's very important to know that you can't just manage your way into a VR. You, can't get, you can get 5 or 10% improvement through management strategies. You cannot lead your, you know, you cannot lead, I mean, you cannot manage your way into battle. You have to lead your team. And that's what we really, um, that's what we really need. Uh, I won't go into this, I have another talk about this, but management and leadership both do three things. They say what to do, how do you organize people to do it, and ensure it gets done. Now, if you look at these two sides of the coin, they're all very essential for any functional team. Any functional organization must have these in a good balance. But if you think about yourself, your team, maybe you lean one way or maybe you lean another. And what we're going to talk about is how do we do the, uh, the, the, left, the left side of the screen, which is how do we look at innovating, creating new genres that are native to the VR platform. You still need to reduce your risk. You still need to do those other things. And these design strategies come from a year of, that we've spent looking at and interviewing players that have been doing design, um, sorry, virtual reality experiences, everything from Google Cardboard to Oculus VR to uh, some of the, um, to, you know, to the Rift and to the Vive and stuff like that. It's all about how do we create uh, emotion. So this is, let's dive in. We've had, uh, at Zio Design, we've created a, a playbook of 36 design strategies for better VR experiences. Uh, you'll see uh, some of them listed up here. And uh, what we're doing is we're then uh, looking at today is we're going to look at five of those. So we can't do all 36, I'm sorry. We only have 60 minutes, but we can do five. And so we're going to go really fast through, uh, through six of them. 
Uh, and if you like, if you can hand me your card at the end, I can give you, uh, there'll be an infographic that summarizes uh, today's talk, and I'm happy to share that with you. So let's look at uh, the first one, which is, uh, which is audience. So we're going to look at first is designing for the, the VR audience. And for audiences, uh, what we need to do is we need to, we have this really hard problem with VR in that, uh, how many people have seen the technology curve? How many read Crossing the Chasm by, um, by Jeffrey Moore? Oh, okay. So what we've got, this is a really interesting problem, is that in the beginning, you have your early adopters, right? VR is here. So you need the people that will spend $500 on a headset, buying those headsets. And then you have the mass market, uh, the mass market is, comes in much later. And the problem with, uh, is that there's this, if you see this white bar, there's a transition between the early adopters and the later adopters. And uh, they both have two, those two audiences have very different tastes and very different, uh, diff very different feelings. So VR is here, and we, of course, want VR to go beyond a novelty and reach a mass market. So traditional hardcore game mechanics and game genres will address that early adopter model, right? But the problem is that this is what player, and this is what hardcore gamers that will spend money for the VR headsets will want. The challenge is that, in our experience so far, what VR is really good at delivering, this generation, much better than the VR I worked in 20 years ago, uh, but this generation of VR is, uh, can, does different things. And so there's an educational thing. So what VR does well is different than deliver a lot of, a lot of common hardcore game uh, genre mechanics. And so you have to find as your team, as this first strategy, that sweet spot between what hardcore gamers want, what people will spend money for your headset want, and the kind of, uh, the kind of, uh, um, the kind of experiences that VR does well. Now, if you do mass market, uh, if you go for Google Cardboard, $20, that's much more of a mass market price point, and so you're going to get a lot more people playing your game. So essentially, you want to be sure you're designing the audience. You want to be sure there's a match between the audience that's buying that hardware and the game mechanics that you're delivering, those kinds of experiences. The second design strategy is all about comfort. And so we want to uh, basically avoid uh, triggering disgust and phobias. We want to make disbelief, if in a sense, um, comfortable. And so fast motion, precise targeting, fast turns around a point, all of these things are uh, very disruptive to a good, comfortable VR experience. Uh, and it sort of goes like this. If you haven't, how many people have tried, have not tried VR? Everybody's tried VR. Everyone, how many people have tried VR? Okay, okay, there you go. So you might know uh, this slide. This is kind of uh, what VR feels like. Even if it's really tuned, it's like walking up an escalator that stopped. You know, that feeling of like, I should be moving, but I'm not. Uh, that's the kind of, um, on, the very, uh, on the very low end, on the very high end, you want to rip it off your face and throw up. Uh, it sounds very similar on the psychological standpoint to something like this. This is called the Uncanny Valley. Have people heard, how many people have heard of the Uncanny Valley? There we go, right? The emotion for Uncanny Valley is disgust. Okay, it's the dis disconnect between what your eyes are seeing and what your, what your, um, what your sensory system or what your, what your rest of you is, um, is experiencing or knows. Instead of just, like, it was a robot, it's from robotics, which is like how robots move, right? It was originally designed in robotics. The more humanoid the robot, the, uh, you know, the better the, uh, the appeal was until it got almost human and then it went way down. Well, we are, VR is basically down in that trough and you just have to, you start there and you have to try and climb up with everything we care about, which is like frame rate, camera and controls, all of those things uh, need, to, need to avoid triggering disgust. And the reason why is that if you do trigger disgust, not only does it last for a couple hours, maybe even the rest of the day, uh, it makes players say stuff like this. So this is a quote. It's like, I never want to do this again. It's way more involved, much more expensive, and it, it just makes you feel horrible. That's not what you want out of your, uh, you know, out of your, um, uh, you know, out of your experience. You, know, you want people to, uh, you know, have an experience like this and think, oh, and get excited, and fake zombie, not, not real zombie, and it's going to eat me. So the second aspect of this is that it actually can also trigger phobias. Uh, Jed Ashford from uh, Sony has done some really interesting talks on this, where phobias are, uh, you can actually, it's so real, virtual reality can be so real, you can actually trigger a phobia. So if you are afraid of a zombie, really afraid of a zombie, or somebody shouting at you really close, or walking across fear of heights, walking across a rickety bridge, you could actually rip the thing off your face because you were really scared and it's not entertainment at all. Without the frame to guide you, you can, these experiences can be quite compelling. 
One of the most compelling experiences I've played is this rabid, <laughs> rabid VR ride <laughs> at, at E3 from Ubisoft. And it's on a little uh, shaky platform. And uh, it's, it's the rabbits, they're having fun. Uh, and it's a really nice, uh, nice example of how to provide a little bit of sensory impact uh, input, just the haptics, even sloppy ones, feel really good and really make these things a lot more comfortable. A couple more techniques on the comfort are here. So you want to frame the action. So this is VR Sports Challenge. Uh, so you've got uh, lines from the goalies' masks, still have fast action, but you know where you are. Eve Valkyrie is doing some framing as well. So that cockpit, oh, yeah, that cockpit, let's see. Go back, there we go. There we go. Yeah, so um, Eve Valkyrie uh, goes um, frames with a cockpit. And that sense of frame tells you where you are. And just in your basic, if you go back to your basic physics lessons, you know, if you have a frame of reference, establish that frame of reference, motion within that frame of reference, actually makes you feel like you're standing still. So that's why psychologically we're able to handle that a lot better. The other one is, uh, the other one I love is slow-mo. I love this one by, the showdown by Epic. And it's, you don't know what bullet time feels like. Your body doesn't know. <laughs> so it's like, okay. And it's a lot more accepting of this, a lot more accepting of zero G in space, a lot more accepting of underwater. So these other experiences, because they are uncommon, really, really help uh, increase the comfort level uh, and pull us out of that uncanny valley. Uh, the next thing is that with motion of the camera, we really don't want to do a lot of it. Uh, we want to have the player in control of the camera for most of the time. This is Roco, um, Rococo, which is uh, a really wonderful French revolutionary game. Uh, you see that they've got a very stylized look, which pulls us out of the Uncanny Valley, because it's, you know, it's, uh, it's stylized. And then they move the camera around by, this, uh, by you choosing, and then when you choose, you get this smoke cursor, or this smoke animation, that tells you, hey, user, I'm going to go over here and then you wait for the smoke to clear, and then you lights down and we come up in the new spot. So we're directing attention to where we want to go. Uh, a game called Bazaar also from Templegate Games also does this, uh, where they're directing the person before they move the camera or during the round of turn for Bazaar. So that's, that's comfort. The next uh, strategy is we're going to look at is, uh, is controls and camera. Because at the heart of, uh, of comfort is basically the ability for uh, us to deal with this new thing. Without a frame of reference, when you're in a world, the two biggest uh, obstacles are, are these two things. And what we want to do is we want to provide direct controls native to VR. And this is a big mistake a lot of the developers we're working with right now uh, make. And, you know, you know, back in the day, you know, I, made the, I designed the first iPhone game, right? And I designed it to basically be an accelerometer game where you tilt, you, know, you rotate the phone left and right. Uh, but soon, when the App Store opened, um, and lots of games were there, then we had, you remember those D-pads on the iPhone? Do you remember how fun that is, you know, the virtual D-pads? How many people had lots of fun with virtual D-pads on the iPhones? Okay. <laughs> okay, we got one person way in the back. Awesome. Uh, so a virtual D-pad, uh, you know, putting a, game, a traditional game controller into a VR app is kind of like putting a virtual D-pad into an iPhone game. Now, we don't know what a VR controller is going to look like. You know, we're going to see. We've got a lot of runners, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, stuff going on, a lot of uh, hardware coming in. So we'll see what, what happens there. But if we don't, um, this is a little bit of what, what happens. Is if, you, if you come to the design with the last generation thinking, you, have a, you can have a hard time delivering a really native VR experience. So this is a wonderful game, um, Edge of Nowhere by Insomniac. Very smart people. I love and play a lot of their games. Um, the challenge that this is going to have is because this is a, running, a diagonal jumping puzzle, uh, you know, you've got the buttons, uh, which you can't see, and then you have uh, not only uh, are you not moving forward when you, your, your character moves forward, but you're also not moving sideways when your character moves on that diagonal. And then you have a, a follow cam. So your vestibular system, you're not triggering your cochlea this way, right, by not moving forward when I do a diagonal, and then I'm also not triggering my cochlea this way when I'm not moving sideways. So you're kind of doubling down on the amount of potential disgust you're going to feel by just by having the action happen in a diagonal uh, where your character's moving, but you know, maybe you're, you're not. There's a lot of ways to solve this, and I'm looking forward to see how they, how they do that. So what we're looking for, the design win here, is control so natural, you can just play blindfolded because that's what it is. You, don't, you are blindfolded as far as the real world goes when you're in VR. 
So there's a lot of stuff you can do. Um, you want to deliver an experience that feels like this. So using native gestures, you know, you maybe you don't want a flying harness. That's a little bit much for most VR <laughs> games. But you know, just that you're, you're getting that sense of you're really in that space and that you're doing some really supernatural gestures. Now, you might be thinking, well, how could you do that? Well, you've got the Leap Motion now has a little thing you can put up on the front of your head-mounted displays, right? And they'll do a video projection, which is awesome, of your hands. Ghosting your video projection. Don't do the real, the real hands, but the ghost is great. And then uh, another solution might be uh, what Templegate Games did with Bazaar is that they did a nod. This is a wonderful thing where they're, um, you basically nod or shake your head uh, to dismiss dialog boxes. So they're using gestures that are native to the platform in order to you know, get control. Now, the jury's out as to far as like, what else will happen. But uh, one couple of hints uh, about what works really well is, first of all, you want to have your hands in a native, in a native position. So this on a console game is not when you're out you know, exploring mist or something like that, or even hitting a tennis racket, that's not it. So game console, not so good. The Vive has got this two-handed sort of gesture. The Half Moons from, um, uh, from Oculus also have this. So I'm more likely to feel like I'm in the world because my arm is moving. And then I've, I've got, I remember haptics are really important. So the gestures that my hands can make, they can, the fingers can curl, right? And they can move around a little bit. But those curling sort of gestures, the grabbing, things that mimic that are really close to that are going to feel a lot more satisfying for people than pushing a button. Now, most hardcore game players, of course, don't really think about pushing the button. But if you want to, again, jump to that mass market, eventually with your studio and with your title, then getting native gestures, like, you know, if you think about Monument Valley on the iPad, getting into the game is super, super important. So, the, uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's controls. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is the fourth one, which is something, uh, uh, one of my favorite topics in all of game design, which is emotion. And we're going to look at creating uh, emotion for these, uh, these kinds of experiences. And so to, to kick this one off, uh, I thought I'd ask an expert on emotion, Mr. Hitchcock here. And uh, I'd like to think about, think about him for a second. Uh, what is Hitchcock the master, the master of? Is he the master of A, jump scares, B, fear, or C, suspense? Yeah, so it's not jump scares. I see a lot of jump scares out in the VR world, right? And the thing is that you know, just because you can turn it up to 11 in VR, in virtual reality, we do feel a lot more emotion than we do uh, with a normal game, doesn't mean that you should, OK? Because it's basically like typing all caps all the time, right? Don't, don't do this. Uh, if you think about a movie like Aliens, Aliens is a great movie. You don't see the actual alien until reel three. You just see like a, a, go, you know, a ghost of it, you hear a noise, oh, it was the cat. You know, you see some acid blood, you know, you don't see the actual alien, and that is all building up. It's that feeling of suspense will make a much more compelling experience. And then when you look at your palette, uh, hardcore games, traditional games are wonderful. They also have a, a range of emotions that are really good and work really well for those platforms. VR is going to have a different range of emotions. Some will be the same and some will be different. So the first ones to jump over are, of course, uh, you know, fear, fear. The, the, I think those, those horror movies are going to be great in VR. Uh, and then the other one is um, like disgust or violence. And you have to be fairly careful for two reasons with violence. Because one, if you have a dead body in VR, it looks like a real dead body. And so if you're doing your job well and really creating a world, and so you need to have that bit of a disconnect so that they still feel it's play, right? It's not a real dead body. Um, and then the second thing, if you trigger disgust, like blood, vomit, feces, these are all things we are biologically react uh, programmed to um, have the disgust reaction, which is basically to throw up. You know, if you've, if you've eaten something, if you've eaten a poison berry, if you've drank too much, your system will, like, you feel disgusted and queasy, and then you throw up to get it out of your system. If you see blood and you got disgusted by it, uh, you may then have a slight queasiness from the VR headset, and then you're going to have to rip it off because you just can't stay in anymore. So you want that balance. So targeting emotions that pull players in can be this nice counterpoint uh, to what you're doing uh, in, the rest of, in the rest of the game. Uh, the other thing to think about is that frustration also can be, from certain aspects, uh, might need to be less for some users. 
So uh, essentially with uh, what we call hard fun, if you have uh, a continuum of challenge on one, one axis and uh, player skill on the other, as the game gets, uh, as the player gets hard, uh, more advanced in their skill, the challenge needs to go up, right? But if it goes up too quickly, the player will leave because they're frustrated. If it's too easy, they'll leave because they're bored. And with VR, uh, there may be a different setting for your users. So when you do your player testing, be really aware that that challenge may not be the same, may not be the same for those users uh, as they are with a traditional console game. So you may, in a sense, need to bring the, um, bring the, bring the emotion uh, down, the amount of challenge uh, down. The uh, only way you can get that feeling of win, like you saw me do at the very beginning of the talk, uh, the Fiero gesture, is if you're so frustrated, you're about ready to quit and throw the iPhone or throw the, throw the headset off, I guess, and then you win. That's, when, that's that really big, uh, big feeling we get from playing games. That's why the basketball hoop is small and overhead, because it takes a lot of frustration to get it there, and then once you succeed, all right, that's really good. VR is going to tweak that just slightly. Uh, these emotion profiles, if you don't believe me, uh, the emotion profile and emotion architectures are why so many love the Vive demos. There's a, there are differences in technology across all of the platforms. But one thing that really impressed me about, um, about the Vive is that the, uh, is that the demos they're using to demonstrate the hardware all have really rich emotional architectures, whether it's a creativity from the tilt brush, this is big blue, where you have these moments, and they, they're almost like interactive cinema because they're moving you emotionally. So on VR, some emotions that work well. Um, this is uh, the gallery, so mist style exploration games. So they're using curiosity. They're designing stuff, they're designing stuff in these worlds to pull the player in and then, and then move, them, move them along. So if remember, if disgust is to push away, pull the mask off, right? the magic goggles off, uh, curiosity is like, oh, what's, what's behind that next corner, right? What, what, is, what is above that shelf? What is inside this world? So the emotion is pulling you in. And actually, if you can create enough curiosity, you can actually mitigate a lot of disgust. Does that make sense? So you can actually change how people physiologically feel if you can deliver enough emotion in another, in another sector um, of, the, of their emotion, of the emotion profile. Uh, we do this with Follow the White Rabbit with these little, um, we, we put in little clues and little moments, little beats. So this is our Magritte style painting, this is not a rabbit. Gets you just curious and, and lets you move in uh, closer. All of these uh, work together to create what we call the micro loop of, uh, of gameplay. And uh, these are some techniques. There's more uh, if you go into the four keys. But controls, creativity, exploration, and fantasy are all great tools to pull people in. And the micro loop is that moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. And there's a lot of opportunity to get people in, uh, in VR experiences to really pull them, uh, pull them in. Uh, the next thing, though, we have to do is we then have to um, also uh, support uh, some other, other experiences, other types of fun. So hard fun. You want puzzles and other things to collect, things to do in the world. If we want VR to not be a novelty, we need to have, we need to have some challenge and supporting some of the other, the other keys. So this is, um, this is Steam Crew, uh, which is also a global jam. Uh, they, they were one of the winners. And uh, you, had, you have cooperative, cooperation. Uh, Cast AR is a wonderful uh, platform, and it has some very cool stuff because it's face-to-face -face interaction. So it's really how wonderful to be able to like, see, your, see your brother's face or see your sister's face while you're actually playing the game. Because then as you, as you go you know, face to face, uh, you can actually create uh, more emotional reactions and more, more things that, that can work out um, together, working together. It's kind of really odd, you know, we've had this history of console gaming where we actually play side by side and we never look at each other as much except in between things. In a, in a tabletop Star Wars 3D chess, you can actually look at each other, and that's a huge source of emotion. And if you remember, emotion is really one of the most critical things a game needs to deliver in order to have a good game experience. It might seem counterintuitive, but from the psychology standpoint, the, uh, we, ha we make rational, we have a rational cognitive side, we also have this irrational emotion side, and basically both systems are required to actually make a decision from the, psych from our, from the way we're wired. And so every decision you've ever made in a game, in the world, in real life, in VR, has actually been made on an emotional level first. Good game designers do this intuitively. Other designers can you know, learn and look at uh, by watching people play, um, by using models and, and research and stuff like that to get new, new stuff. 
person-to-person interaction like this, we call it people fun, there's more emotion in that kind of play than all, um, all three other keys combined. People have more emotion, more frequent emotion, wider variety of emotion uh, in group play than they do playing the same game in two different, different rooms. It's a really interesting uh, thing. The other thing that really people really, really like from a psychology standpoint is they really like, they really like stories, they really like finding out relationships. So if anyone is doing a mystery in the mystery genre, remember that it's not the hardware, it's not the you know, kernel mustard, candlestick, kitchen, uh, you know, the, the, what was done. It was more about the relationships. Mysteries are all about the relationship and figuring out the, what, were the, what was the motivation. It's about the motivation. That's what gives the pe people in a mystery a satisfying, oh yeah, I figured that out. That's what makes Sherlock Holmes such an amazing, uh, such an amazing uh, genre, uh, genre of books. Looking forward, before we leave emotion, uh, I wanted to talk one more thing, is that emotion is uh, such a wonderful tool. We don't use it nearly in the way that we're going to. Five, ten years from now, we're going to be, it's going to be amazing what, what computers are going to be able to do, because we're just at the cusp of it uh, with technologies. And in the future, we can actually use you know, emotions as input. Now, the one thing I love is that with a head-mounted display, you've already got something on your face. And so we can put some little sensors here. We can put some, some cameras on the eyes. The eye shapes is what I use. Uh, with Paul Ekman's facial action coding. And we can actually use emotion as input to, to drive games. Here I'm playing a game by uh, Chrono Sapien Interactive where I have to give, be as evil as I can. As you can see, I'm looking very evil there. Uh, and it's measuring my frown, so I trick the camera into you know, giving the angelic pose and then doing a frown. And then you powers up the, the evil dude by changing the face. So I think Nevermind has got another example of using emotion as input. Uh, lots of really cool stuff happening, happening there. So I'd like to wrap up with uh, uh, a last one. We'd like to look at fun, because that's really what fun, fun is really what it's all, all about. So in emo you know, with emotion, we want to whisper. We don't want to yell. Don't turn up to 11. With fun, we want to, and we want to establish a, a micro loop, get that curiosity to pull people in. With fun, we want to like, give you a lot to, in that micro loop, moment to moment fun. Uh, and then people will move between different types of fun, so we want to be sure we can escape the micro loop. And the failure to escape the micro loop of fun is why most VR experiences are a five to 10 minute experience. And people just put it down after that. Uh, you know, one, you know, maybe not a lot of content, that's true. But there's also, you know, in a, as human beings, I can get, and most of you can design, I can give you an experience, I can get you to play almost any kind of experience for about five to 10 to 15 minutes. It doesn't really matter what it is. But after that 15-minute mark, or maybe five minutes or two minutes on mobile, on a mobile game, people will put it down because it's just not novelty. It didn't hook them into some, some deeper gameplay challenge. And so what we're looking at uh, next is how do we take these, if we don't want to be just the Nickelodeon, we want to move from the Nickelodeon to, uh, you know, to be Warner Brothers or something like that, to be, being a great you know, Spielbergs and great uh, movie directors like Hitchcock. Uh, we need to move out of the microloop and create additional emotions. So what it makes you want to think about, how are we going to motivate uh, our design to do that? So if we look at the HoloLens as we see it now, it's really cool that, you know, a novelty factor that, hey, I can have Minecraft all over my living room. But then after I've had Minecraft all over my living room, is there something else? Does, it, does the platform offer a new, you know, something new to do, new type of fun? Uh, in, this, in this game, uh, Anshar Wars, you know, after the novelty, after the novelty wears off, you know, of, of being a ball gunner, it's really cool, it's like, I've always wanted to be in Star Wars, right? Uh, then, but I've kind of get this feeling that I've played this game before. Again, it's a really great game, they're doing some really good stuff, but what's next, right? What is VR, what, what in the gameplay terms could only happen in VR? I've got the camera, I can roll around, I'm a ball, you know, I'm a ball turret, I can just roll around and stuff like that, but what is new in terms of gameplay? I think that the, uh, uh, the uh, next one, yes, there we go. So for Sony's Playroom, uh, this one does more successfully, much more casual audience, but you play Godzilla and you have the VR headset and your other friends are, don't have headsets and are just running minions. And you can, the VR headset, you can use your head to knock buildings over. So that's kind of a, there's a kind of a fun, a fun gameplay that's happening there. Uh, that's not just, uh, that's not just, just novelty. So we get, uh, I'm going to go some other examples, but first I want to talk about these this idea of nested engagement loops. So we have that easy fun with the micro loop, which is the tight one. 
So we have easy fun, um, and then the outside of that, there's the hard fun, which is the main loop of the game. So it's challenge and mastery. Then there's people fun, which is all about um, uh, social engagement. And then there's uh, serious fun, which is the meta loop, which is collection and completion uh, and you know, desire and stuff like that. And so we've got these nested loops and what games do, uh, whether it's playing chess you know, in the real world or playing you know, Eve Valkyrie, is you've got these nested loops and people move between them. So you're always engaged. You know, just dribbling the basketball is fun all on its own. That's the micro loop of gameplay for basketball. Shooting hoops you know, is you know, with a score and with people and teammates. A lot more, you know, people fun. And uh, then you get serious fun from the workout and, and, um, and, you know, winning a championship, something like that. So then when we do break out, what we want to do is we want to add, look at your game, look at that micro loop, make sure you've got a really tight, I mean, just like dribbling the basketball, just moving around that world is super fun. The second thing is then look at the, your VR goal. Like, what is a, a goal that could only happen in VR? Creates a little bit of frustration and can be that core loop of your game mechanic. So you've got your micro loop at the, in the, at the center and then your, um, your uh, VR loop, your, your um, meta loop, uh, sorry, your, your, your main core loop uh, outside of that. And then, uh, your, uh, uh, then you have this, maybe a collection loop, a meta loop, some, so that as you complete those, uh, your core loop, you're then building on that more meta loop through a collection mechanic and uh, creating, creating desire. So it's a big challenge just to get that micro loop working, exploration, role play, and that sort of thing. And then getting these other ones on top of it is what that art of game design is. Uh, and it is what we could do with, uh, this is source two from the um, portal uh, demo. And uh, what we could do here is we've got lovely exploration going, lovely micro loop. How many people have, have played this on the Vive? Yeah, a few, oh, okay. Yeah, I definitely recommend these, the Vive demo. Well, I recommend all of them. There's so many great demos from many platforms. This one is nice because it's a portal, of course. And then you can actually look at, it's in 3D, so you can look at these animations, you can kind of interact with it. What would escape that micro loop of gameplay to go from easy fun to hard fun would be a bit of a challenge, right? And it would be like something I needed to accomplish. Uh, Story-wise, there is just the root of that. I'm hoping that they'll take it even further so that we can actually you know, play a nice game with this. I think that would be very, very cool. Another example uh, of, some, of a, some, an innovative game uh, that's doing some of this is, the, is Bazaar from Templegate Games. I mentioned them earlier. Here they've got a meta progress map at the, in the stars above, above the player's head. And so as you look up, you look around, uh, there are uh, the um, constellations. Every, everything you win goes up into a constellation. When you complete the constellation, you get that power up, which unlocks, you know, in a sense, the next level. So they direct your attention, and then they have this wonderful native, uh, native controls or native VR um, UI up above, um, up above them uh, in the head. And I think that's in the sky. I think that's really nice. Because with the UI, going back to what we, what we really want to for comfort, is that the, uh, with UI, you really want it to be embedded in the world. Uh, if we do the traditional thing of putting it in front of you, sometimes you want to put it just in front of the user wherever they go, but it feels oftentimes claustrophobic and like you just like slapped a newspaper, you know, right to their face. And they can't get out of it, it's claustrophobic, they are, the headset's already claustrophobic, so you know, you don't want to like, you know, double trigger on that. So having UI in the world is great, so I love this progress map from Templegate. I've seen other UI that are like, you know, they're just like on a, on a signpost or just, you know, you select something and it comes up and that UI comes up and then you look away and then it goes away. And that's important not to leave the signpost up because if you look away <laughs> and start selecting other things and they're disabled because this, this dialogue that I can no longer see in the UI is not, you know, I can't see it anymore, you know, that can create a, um, uh, a, big, a, big, a big challenge. Uh, so uh, I think the, the last thing is that, you know, VR, it's important, VR is not a technology, right? Um, VR is an experience and how you get to that, how you know you get that, you're getting that experience, is do a lot of player testing. And you want to look for reactions like, uh, like we did for Follow the White Rabbit here uh, we, when we showed it at PAX. Awesome. So you just played Follow the White Rabbit. What did you think? It's so cool. I love Alice in Wonderland, everything about it. And I love puzzles. Puzzles are my thing. Like portals and anything that has to do with figuring stuff out and finding things and all that. I, I'm, I'm excited. That was so cool. Like, I get lost, you get lost in the world, and like, I'm kind of speechless right now. <laughs> like, virtual reality is becoming real, and it's so exciting. 
So, so those, those kind of, if you can see like the, it's the emotion that you're, she's feeling, some of it's the words, but it's the emotion that you can just feel. You can give people a survey and they'll say on a scale of one to 10, how much did you like the game? How fun was it? You know, whether or not I promoted to a friend, there's some pretty good stuff with that. You know, seven is the five. So seven is an average game on a 10 point scale, just a little bit of psych trivia there, uh, or, you know, user testing trivia. Um, but when you see people like completely overwhelmed, by that experience, and then overwhelmed by their second experience or third experience, it's not just their first VR, that's when you know you've got, that's the little nugget, that's the, that's the fun that you're trying to, trying to follow. So to, uh, to wrap up, because I wanted to have a few minutes for, uh, for questions, is that AR really needs uh, design, design leadership. So with, with the audience, you want to be sure that you can match, you want to make sure that you match your, your game with the hardware and the, with the people that, would, that can buy the hardware. You want to hopefully cross that chasm into a mass market as, you, as we grow. And uh, we also then want uh, comfort. So we want to look at, you know, want to make that disbelief more comfortable. We can do that by obscuring detail, like using that Rococo, that stylized, you know, visuals. We can also stylize um, the, uh, we, could also, uh, we could also do several things to make, um, make that experience uh, you know, le you know, more, more believable. And uh, you know, avoid triggering or give people the ability to um, you know, back off of challenges and stuff like that if they become too, too intense. Go into theater mode, you know, Jed Ashford talks about. Uh, and for controls, you really want to provide um, stuff that you, know, you could play blindfolded. Uh, you know, stuff that, that could happen regardless of what uh, else the experience is, is delivering. And then for the emotion, looking at emotions that pull players in, maximize those, and then be careful with the ones that can push them, push them away. And emotions come from the content and the uh, art style and the audio and everything else, the story that's happening in the game. But don't forget that emotions also come from the actions players take. And those actions, the emotions from the actions, that's what makes a game a game and not a movie. Okay, everything in movies, you know, is one hand, and then the interaction, like with the four keys to fun, is all about how do the actions in games create, uh, create emotion. And uh, with the uh, fun, we want to be sure we can escape the micro loop of, uh, of gameplay so that we can go on and, uh, you know, try different, different things. Um, but the most important strategy I kind of left for last. And uh, the most important design strategy, given, you know, everybody here, you're super interested in VR, there's the amount of talent, I can just feel it, you know, coming, coming back at me. The most important design strategy uh, for successful games in VR, getting VR out into delivering all the promises we all passionately believe in, the most important strategy is you. Okay? So the breakout hit for VR is still being designed. You know, it can come from anywhere. It can come, it can be in development right now in this audience. So go out and do it and, you know, follow your dreams and uh, come, come back and tell me about it. All right? And so the next time you ask this question about where's the fun, uh, think of these, uh, of these strategies, you know, whether we can cross the chasm, making disbelief comfortable, target emotions, and escape the micro loop. And, uh, and of course, there's, there's more. So uh, we've got... Uh, if you'd like to have a, an infographic, you can uh, come up afterwards, and um, I'm ready for, uh, ready for questions. So, uh, yeah, if you'd like to, you, this is my contact info, if you'd like more, there's some questions. Uh, I wanted to leave some time, so we've got about, uh, about 15 minutes. We're happy to talk about VR and emotion, and there's a lot of stuff that I wasn't able to put in the presentation, but I wanted to customize it to what you guys wanted to see. So, yes, over there. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was very nice. Thank you. Um, so I just wonder, have you seen any system that handles interaction where your body is projected into the world and handled it in a nice way? Like for instance, if you have the, if you have the leap motion, you can get tracking for the hands, but interaction with the world is still going to be extremely forceful. Like you can push your hand through objects right. and that's like the, an obvious issue. Um, so. Have you seen any solutions to that issue? Yeah. And yeah, just if you could comment on that. Sure, yeah. I think the most successful design strategy around hands does come uh, a, couple of, a couple of really good things. So Leap Motion, uh, up to about a year ago or half a year ago, they were really into the articulated hands, right? They were really into making sure that this was accurate. They gave you skin. They gave you gloves. And all of that went into the uncanny, the disgust, like those aren't my real hands, right? Those aren't my real stuff, so that pulls you out. And you're absolutely right, if I see my real hands out there, then I don't get the tactile feedback that I'm touching things, or I might accidentally knock over a vase. That's not very good. 
uh, on the uh, on the Vive, I thought they did a really nice uh, uh, a nice solution where they they actually mimic uh, they actually project into the world your visual world, not your hands, but the controllers, just the control sticks, and they're they're minimized versions, they're customized for the different games, uh, so you've got just the controllers in the world kind of moving moving around. Um, like you saw in the gallery, you have a, uh, a hand that's moving around. And for me, I think it's going to be, a, it's going to be, I think there will be a variety of solutions. I'm more on the don't show me my hands or give me ghost hands and try and make it really real. Because when I see that, I think that causes a, a disconnect between, you know, me and the, uh, and me and what the objects, what the objects are. Thanks. So, thanks, yeah. Uh, so you briefly mentioned um, doing, I guess, uh, what would you call it, like metrics on the, the player's emotions. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with the Fove headset that does, uh, yeah. purports to do eye tracking. Do you think that the, what you know about the hardware, is that also something you could use for that emotional feedback? Yeah, that, that I'm really looking forward to coming out. I've played with it uh, just uh, in the demo. I haven't actually been able to, you know, hook it up to a, an emotion tracker. But I think that's uh, good. So with the Fove, what they do is they, uh, they have a camera that faces, most of these headsets have some kind of camera or light sensor that faces the eye. And so you have, um, if, you, if you can do it with enough lighting, you can get some of the eye gestures. And of the seven emotions you can measure in the face, uh, a lot of them are differentiated on the, in the eye, in just the shape of the eye. Uh, not some, it's surprising, it's not just, the, you know, not just the smile. So I think the Fove's got a really great start and then we'll see um, I know some, I've heard that some of the major platforms have dropped, you know, kind of face tracking through their headsets, um, but, we will, but we will see. Uh, the interesting thing about it is that if you go into, like, when you're tracking motions, you know, moment by moment, uh, a couple of things happen. So it's, as an input device, it's kind of an, an interesting opportunity. Uh, but we don't know, you first of all have to, we don't know if that surprise was happening from the game. Or was that surprise happening from them uh, remi remembering something, you know, the talk they had with their significant other in the morning, right? And they just had a big aha moment. We also don't know, like, you know, your surprise or your frustration might be less or more than my frustration. And then, as we said, with games, frustration's good, right? You know, frustration is like, you know, you want to be frustrated. So is that good frustration or bad frustration? So there's a lot of really hard work that has to go in. But for me, hands down, I'm, I'm a big, the biggest believer in, uh, in eye tracking. Uh, and that's the eye shape tracking, not the pupil tracking. And just uh, one last, for your emotions, yeah. One last question. Is there any other biometric feedback, so like EEG or something that you could do through the headset that you have thought about or? Yeah, there are a couple of really interesting platforms uh, that are measuring, uh, e for example, EEG is a great one. Uh, the EEG will measure the first quarter inch of electrical activity on your cortex, fun fact. Uh, where do emotions sit? Where, emo where do emotions happen? Does anyone know? Hippocampus or something? Yeah, hippocampus or something. Where is that? That was like way down, right? I don't even, my, I go back to the beginning of my deck. It's like way down. That's in the base, that's the base brain. That's your lizard brain, right? That's your, you know, your, you know. It's so, so your neocortex is up here, your thoughts and cognition, and then your emotions are at that, at that bottom, in the bottom middle. It's too far away. It's too far away. And then, of course, if you could sense it, I don't know if I'd want to put that much voltage on my head, right? <laughs> you know, drilling, drilling down. There is some promise that big data could possibly, you know, kind of tease it out. But getting emotions through, a, um, through tracking your skull is going to be pretty, pretty challenging. So what do they do? Really good thing for EEGs is relaxation, focus, concentration, general shifting. My favorite game is uh, um, played years ago with, uh, it was like a force trainer, Jedi force trainer, and you, if you relaxed, a little ping pong ball would, was, there was a fan in a, in a tube and a ping pong ball, and the fan would turn on if I relaxed, and so the, the ping pong ball would rise, so I could feel like I was, you know, using the force. That was fun. But, you know, very narrow as far as, like, emotion tracking uh, goes. And I, I, as I showed, there was, like, an evil face generator, which, uh, control for one, of the, for one of the things. So, yeah, thanks. Um, I was wondering if you could solve some of these problems by, um, well, for different people, uh, by using like sliders at the beginning. Uh, for example, like um, difficulty sliders, people do that now, um, like normal, medium, easy, and uh, that makes games generally three times better because there's more of an audience. Um, so. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a really, really interesting idea. I think uh, I, I first heard of that idea from Jed Ashford uh, at the Nordic Game Conference. I gave a, I gave a keynote on VR. And it's, uh, you know, so you could have a setting that, you know, could go. You could also have a setting on the controller. 
So he was saying that right, rickety bridge thing, you know, you could have in the game, as a game designer, you could control that rickety bridge in a sense, like if it was really scary, too scary, there could be a button that made the bridge wider or made it lower or made you, allowed you to just jump it entirely and then there's no more rickety bridge. So I think that does, uh, you know, does expand our audience. I think it also, though, causes me to think about, so there's difficulty, right? So if games are about difficulty, we, we adjust the difficulty, we give these difficulty settings. In the, uh, in the VR sense, we're talking about emotion, and it's not an intensity of emotion you know, that we're doing. I think it's really rethinking. It's a new platform. It's, I think it's really thinking on how we, how we get players' attention and how do we maintain it over, over time. Creating the, the, the emotions that keep us focused on a frame, uh, you know, it's like the difference between TV and the stage. Uh, you know, the stage has to be, you know, you know, has to be really big, and then in television you have to do the gestures very small because of the way the frame is. I think in VR, we're going to have to rethink the things that, uh, you know, like rickety bridges and boiling lava, you know, may have to be different. Uh, there may be different cues that work really better uh, in, in VR. Yeah, thanks. Oh, over there, and then, yeah. Uh, yeah, hi. You were uh, talking about how, like, the, uh, the hockey mask and the cockpit sort of mm -hmm. served a, as something that sort of grounds you. Yeah. Noses just... are really popular, too. Or there's a lot of research. There's some actual psychological research on noses in VR and how that might help. But it's not the right color or the shape. I don't know. Go ahead. So I, I guess my question is, do you think the success of that is based on them being, like, physically believable in that scene? Or do you think something like a persistent UI that's locked to your head movement could... Uh, could solve that problem as well, or is it? Does it have to be um, something that, like you know, like a hockey mask or? Right. Yeah. So the hockey mask. You know, there's hockey masks. There's a mech, like in a mech warrior. There can be a, um, you know, some controls, like a gun for a gunner, you know, a gunner kind of thing. And there you have the ability to have a frame. But then you're also thinking, like, well, I want to go in a world. I don't want to go to a world in a shark cage, right? You, right. know, you yeah. want to so be I mean, in like really if, swimming with the sharks. If, yeah. those, if those items yeah. are sort of floating and not actually part of the real world, but they are locked to your head movement, so like they always stay, you know, the same way that the hockey mask would stay mm -hmm. centered as your, you know, moving. Right, your, yeah. Your There's a, I, can't, I can't quote actual research on that. I do have research for noses. Uh, and I think you've got to, it's got to be a balance because if you are dragging a lot of UI with you, then uh, you could also, if, there, if that's laggy, you know, that might emphasize that might emphasize lag more than than it helps. But I think it's definitely worth uh, worth exper experimenting. Having UI though in the world does make you feel like you're in the world. Right. And you know, a HUD display is kind of an artifact of the fact that we've been playing games on these screens because we can throw you know that HUD on the glass you know f a, you know uh, similar to a cockpit on a fighter pilot uh, from a fighter plane. You can throw a, a UI on that glass. So that's what we've been been thinking. Great. Thank you. So, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Hey, Nicole, thank you so much for the awesome talk. Um, oh, you're welcome. I really loved, you had this one quote on your slide that said, VR is not a technology, it's an experience. So I guess as we look at VR as sort of this new medium, yeah. how do you think it plays into the space of like cinema? What happens when a cinematic experience and gaming start to collide? And what do you think the future of that space is? I think, well, I think that uh, another, another kind of little, little quip I, I like is that I think about, there's going to be more, there's definitely going to be more emotion. And that where we're at now, you know, with the, in the Google Play Store and stuff with, the, with cardboard, is that, you know, jump scares are like the fart app of VR. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pretty much, right? And so if you think about it that way, you know, think about how far we went in the Apple App Store from the original, you know, those original apps to where we are today. We're going to see that same kind of, or a similar, you know, kind of uh, explosion. And I think that there is, uh, for me, it was a very transformative experience as a designer and researcher to take that napkin sketch of, you know, the scene that you see for Follow the White Rabbit, and then suddenly be able to, uh, you know, Brandon did the amazing art, got it into Unity, and I, the first time I like put it on, I, I've been doing games for a while. It's like, wow, I really, I was inside my own head. It was very meta. It was just like very, very self-referential. It's like, whoa. So I think that we can really can create these wonderlands. We really can create these places and spaces that, that uh, will go. I think we'll have sort of two, uh, I believe we'll have sort of the uh, god cams are really, are really good. So I think we'll have a lot of the tabletop looking down. God cams are very comfortable. So we get a lot just looking around with the camera. Great way to control head as camera is a really great thing in VR. And then taking that further, though, you know, we really like to get down on the sim level. 
you know, we really like to like look and play with the people's lives or, you know, shoot them or, you know, play with them, dress them, whatever. You know, all kinds of games, race them with cars. And I think that there will be uh, some traditional games that will go into VR, like, you know, RTS and that sort of thing. And then there will be um, adventure games and exploration games will be another huge, and then another category of things we haven't even thought of yet. So sort of like immersion as a gateway towards empathy, right? Yeah, immersion. Your emotional experience. Yeah, yeah, and that the, the interaction is key. And if you just sit in a theater and watch the movie happen, which is what they did at the very beginning, um, at the very beginning of cinema, they put it in a stage and they just, they didn't, before they invented the two technologies that are the root of all of the language of cinema, which is the frame for attention and the cut to compress time. With games, we add interaction. And I think that VR movies will be kind of good. You know, beautiful Cirque du Soleil. I saw that on the, you know, on the, on the Oculus. And, but, you know, I really, I'm not really getting anything new. If I get to, uh, if I get to have dinner with, um, you, know, uh, you know, dinner with a famous, you know, celebrity, then that might be, you know, if I get to, you know, meet, uh, and if I, I get to meet, uh, have, have dinner with, um, you know, uh, one of my, Amelia Earhart, or, you know, another, you know, someone I admire from the past or present, that's, that's, that might be a little different. But I think that there's going to be a really interesting uh, meld of, the, um, uh, of storytelling and, and, and games. Thank I th you. Yeah. Uh, hi, and thank you for your talk. I yeah. really appreciate it. Uh -huh. So considering the powerful impact of VR on emotion, uh, I want to get your thoughts on how that might impact things such as depression, uh, mm -hmm. suicide, yeah. and maybe the um, either for uh, the worse or for beneficial treatment of, mm -hmm. of that. And ha do you know of any research in that area? There's a huge amount of research going on in VR for medical purposes, absolutely, in games, you know, traditional games for uh, you know, medical purposes. The neat thing about virtual reality is you can really go someplace and feel safe. So you can go, you can have some experience that, you know, so acrophobia, you know, fear of spiders and fear, uh, fear of heights and all kinds of things, fear of flying, can be treated on a, on a VR sense and we're starting to get some pretty solid science behind, behind that. Um, on depression, what I think is amazing is that you can teach mindfulness and meditation and take people to spaces that put them in a different, um, in a different space. And so I think there will be a huge, uh, huge application. And it'll be fairly early on in this, um, in this road, you know, to greater and greater, you know, VR, um, VR abilities, you know, as, as, the, as, the, as the platform matures and the genres come out. I think that this meditation games will be, will be really good. It doesn't mean that all games need to be meditative. It doesn't mean that all games need to have serious qualities. But serious fun, which is that bottom lobe there on the four keys, it's all about how uh, creating, basically creating the experiences um, that change the player and help them change their world. So there's a, a huge, a huge, huge opportunity there. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uh, hi, Nicole. Uh, I just wanted to know, well, I, it was interesting to see how the four keys of fun differ in virtual reality. How can the, also these four keys differ when you're applying virtual reality to gamification, for instance, to change behavior of some people to do some something? Like, how could yeah. that differ? from that scenario? Well, the cool thing about it, if you think about planting trees, like our game Tilt World, uh, you're planting trees in Madagascar, is that we, we, I built that game, I self-financed it, and uh, the, uh, the idea was to like, take something that was very abstract and make it real. So virtual reality can take a very abstract, hard to understand process that maybe is very important, you know, an inconvenient truth, as shall we say, and then you can actually experience that if we made these decisions differently, you know, then the world goes into, you know, uh, Armageddon, you know, tw you know, 200 years earlier. Or we make these other decisions and then we get this beautiful paradise or something like that. And so the, the cognitively, we're actually much more part of these systems than we are when, we're, when we are playing. That, dis that gap between, you know, disbelief and what you're there, it's just, it goes away. In fact, with the uh, Uncanny Valley we were talking about earlier, it's like with, uh, in, in theater, you want to suspend disbelief. It's the art of the suspending disbelief so that you pull in. And in virtual reality, we actually have to push down on that a little bit. You want to be sure there's a little disbelief. <laughs> you often have to push disbelief back into the player a little bit um, to, make them, uh, to, make them, uh, to make them go. So yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity for people to create systems that could change the people because by changing the people, that's what we do. That's what we do to change our, our world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, last question. Okay, uh, so this is kind of a big question, so um, maybe we can follow up later, but uh, what you said about the D-pad being embedded on the iPad screen or so forth uh, and being, being inappropriate or suboptimal, 
uh, got me thinking. I think there's a lot of UX research that needs to be done around VR, and, and it seems that there's a lack of a high bandwidth interface, like a keyboard, uh, in VR. So I was wondering if you could kind of frame the experimental methods people would need to use, or how to frame some of the um, idioms and metaphors that we need to find. Um, like how I've noticed a lot of teams uh, searching for things like that uh, with 3D user interfaces. I think that nobody's really found the ideal idioms or metaphors yet. So what, what kind of guiding principles do you have for that? Yeah, so it is a, and it is a very high level talk because we're starting early, right? You know, and I think that, there's, that we're all learning together. And one of the things I think that's interesting is that if you, we did testing, uh, like we tested the first uh, VR, uh, the first Wii games for LucasArts. So we did, you know, what, is the, what does a lightsaber feel like with the, with the Wii? What, is, what, is a, what does a whip feel like, you know, with the Wii? How can we create more of a feeling of that? And with the Wii and with the Kinect, if you have experiences on those platforms, to a certain extent, the gestures on the iPhone or, you know, the Android, there is an in, imprecision, you know, it's not as precise as a, as a discrete button push. You know, that's, there's an A button and there's a B button and the, you know, I as a user always get them, player always gets them confused, but the game never does. Uh, gestures, the game will get confused, right? So I think that what's challenging with the big pipe, you know, kind of big input, uh, voice recognition is obviously, you know, the, the most natural interface. Um, and that gestures are going to be, it's going to be very hard to get that uh, precision. I think the best, the best example, the one I've had the most fun with, is a, a platform called ZSpace. Have you all heard of ZSpace? I used to work there. Uh, I'm sorry? I used to work there. Oh, okay, there you go. That's the question. And the, uh, maybe, the, uh, so it has, a, it's a platform like a Cintiq, it's a screen like a big, eye, giant iPad, and you have a pen. Uh, actually, a really nice little pen, uh, more like a Wacom pen. And then the, the, uh, you wear very lightweight pro polarized goggles, and then you, uh, uh, you look at it, and the screen comes up towards you, right? The, the, the 3D images come up towards you, and you dip that pen in. And there's that little bit of haptic feedback as you explore around. And so that precision, I, don't, I haven't felt a, a precision in VR as precise as that, because I can see what I'm doing, I'm getting feedback up my arm that I'm doing it. <coughs> and that I've got a nice little small point. And other kinds of controllers are very much, very, very much loose. So, great. Great question. Uh, please feel free to come up uh, after me. If anyone wants an infographic, you can uh, hand me a card. You've been a lovely audience. Thank you so much for having me.